Dodi, in the last episode, we talked about the separation of proteins, a scientific discovery that resulted in a 60-year-old product. Still lives today. It made me think of another milestone that happened around the same time, and it's got to do with a specific Chinese hamster that changed everything. Oh, was this a pet of yours in eighth grade, or what's the story here? This is even more important than my pet, <laughs> Belina. <laughs> Maybe you know the story of Henrietta Lacks. Yes, I, I did read that book. And she was the lady who went into John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. She had cancer. This was in the early 50s. And samples of her cervix tissue were taken by scientists while she was there. She didn't know it then, but her cells started an important cell line that is still used today in biomedical research. Terrific story. Exactly. Famous, well-known, that's her. And that actually leads us into the story of hamster ovary cells and why they matter. Welcome to Discovery Matters. I'm Dodie Axelson. And I'm Connor McCaffrey. Let's get back to Henrietta Lacks. You read the book, you say. Did you see the show? No. You know that Oprah played Henrietta Lacks' daughter. Now, my brothers are all upset because everybody come around make money off our mama's sales, but I don't care nothing about that. What I care about is knowing about my sister and knowing about my mother. The Heller human cell line that scientists developed from Henrietta Lacks, hence the he Got it. Hella, Got it. Henrietta Lacks. From her cervical cancer tissue in 1951 was cloned four years later by a scientist called Theodore Puck, who was working at the University of Colorado Medical Center. It was there in 1957 where he was handed a Chinese hamster. At that time, Chinese hamsters were a standard laboratory animal, just as mice would be today. That's Nicole Both. I'm a professor at the uh, Department of Biotechnology at uh, Buku University in Vienna. Nicole told me how, from this one Chinese hamster's ovaries, Dr. Theodore Puck isolated a cell line. And since then, this cell line has been in culture in most labs that work with animal cells all over the world. So it's been very widely spread. It's kind of had its, its uh, position as one of the uh, easy to cultivate cell lines. And then in, in, in around uh, 1985, people started to, to think about uh, producing uh, therapeutic proteins by recombinant technology. That is that you put the, the the sequence of the gene that you want to produce into a cell line that does not normally produce it. So these Chinese hamster ovary cells, or CHO cells, proved to be quite flexible at learning new instructions. That's better than my kids can do. That is essentially the main uh, advantage of, of uh, CHO cells. Another thing came in that nobody knew about at that time, uh, and that is that um, mammalians uh, or, or mammalian species, uh, each of them have their specific way of adding sugar group groups onto proteins. For instance, if you produce a human protein in a mouse cell line, it will have the human sequence, but it will have the mouse sugar pattern. So if you injected it into a human, the immune system of the of the of the of the patient would recognize it as, as foreign and kind of destroy it which is of course oh. not something that you want to have in a in a therapeutic protein because you don't want it to inject it only to be degraded you want it injected so that it can do its job in the in the in the patient wait hold on a second i don't mean to interrupt but this is all starting to sound a little scary and this reminds me of that scene in Harry Potter where Hermione adds cat hair accidentally to that polyjuice potion. Do you remember that? <laughs> and she actually started to turn into a cat. Uh, are you okay? Do you remember me telling you that the polyjuice potion was only for human transformations? It was cat hair I plucked off Millicent Bulstrobe's robes. Look at my face. Look at your tail. 
Yeah, you know what? I kind of had that thought too, and I put this to Nicole. I wondered if she also felt that when people hear about this, that maybe their imagination start running away from them and they get this kind of crazy picture that you and I both uh, had in our minds. People start, you know, sporting tails or growing furry ears and whether we really need to experiment in this way. But Nicole reassured me that such worries should be reserved for the pages of Harry, Harry Potter, Potter and okay. science fiction and what have you. And in reality, this is actually not the case. Actually, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make it as human-like as possible, simply so that the human patient doesn't recognize it as foreign. I mean, we have an immune system that, that's there to get rid of things that don't belong there, right? So if you make something uh, that, that is different from the way humans make it and, and you inject it into a person, not much will happen except that this protein will disappear quickly because our immune system will destroy it. The, the sugar pattern of the Chinese hamster is as human as you can get or as close or as similar to human as you can get. So that, And this was a mere uh, coincidence actually, it was good luck on the side of science uh, that the cell line that was chosen to generate the first recombinant therapeutic protein actually was one that would produce these proteins just in the way that humans need them and require them. So a specific Chinese hamster was used back in the 1950s, early in the biotech revolution, as a cell line to produce proteins. And this chance kind of event spurred the dominance of this cell line to be used within biotechnology. Yeah, and that was just the beginning. These Cho cells, they're just everywhere now. They're completely instrumental in creating new medicines, new therapies. There is incredible number of, of antibody therapies out there now that, that uh, mostly are in the field of cancer therapy. There are some out that are starting to, to generate more and more uh, revenues that are dealing with rheumatic diseases. There's one uh, treatment there where uh, essentially uh, patients, they receive one injection every half year and essentially are pain-free. And I mean, everybody knows uh, someone in the family who's suffered from that kind of disease. And it's usually it's been a very painful thing to have. Um, and that now with this kind of treatment, you, you a lot of patients that would not respond to any of the traditional medication uh, can 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 really benefit. And how many people do you suppose know that they have a Chinese hamster? to thank for that. Well, not that many, I suppose. If we leave Nicole in Vienna and just look out of the window from here where we are recording in Uppsala, we can see buildings, laboratories, uh, where the echo of that one Chinese hamster still rings out, where Cho cells are being grown and reproduced in huge bioreactors. How does that work exactly? You have kind of a vial of frozen cells. And if you want to create a cellular factory of, of sorts to produce a new protein, you need to take this vial and then you just culture it in, in glass flasks to, to reproduce more, more, more cells. And then in order to get it to produce a therapeutic protein, you need to introduce a DNA molecule that codes for that protein molecule into the, to the cells. Today, you, you can actually synthesize this. this. You, you know the, the code for this specific protein. That, that, that this is Daniel Ivansson. So I'm a senior research engineer working within the, the bioprocess R&D out of Uppsala in Sweden. Daniel's day-to-day -day consists of designing and conducting experiments. Randomly integrated into the genome of those cells. Then what you have to do, since this is a random process, not all cells will introduce the molecules. They will those that introduce it will have it in different copies. At different and if you were to translate you this know, into everyday words, everyday. all that Daniel is saying here? Basically, what Daniel says is it's kind of like the making of like sourdough bread, where you have your yeast and you add sugar and you add flour and so on. Exactly. Like yeast is, is a good. That's exactly the same. Those are cells of, of, as well, of course. And, uh, so it's similar, but they have a little bit more complex needs than, than yeast. Okay, so you mentioned that Daniel works with experiments on an everyday basis. So give me an example. A lot of that things are, is, is actually cut and paste. You try to, you, you cut up a DNA molecule, you paste in a new DNA, DNA molecule in that, and you purify that, and then you have, you have that molecule and you want to introduce it into your show cell. You have your cells and you actually mix it with DNA and you use a high electric field to kind of create a, a small hole in the in the cell so that those DNA molecules can enter the cell and so yeah <laughs> you have a lot of different machineries and and 
you manipulate liquids and you you go from this tiny kind of volumes when you're working with the DNA molecules, which is a microliter volume. And then if you kind of culture the cells, you can go up to hundreds of liters. So it's a lot, big span. Today, with the technologies we do have, I mean, biology is becoming an engineering discipline. We can start to, if not create, at least change and design life, as, uh, if you will, to, to do useful things for us. So, yeah, I mean, when we do, when we do new DNA molecules, we're actually changing life. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So now this is actually starting to sound less like Harry Potter and more like an old Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> how, how do you mean? Well, there was this famous old episode where two astronauts found a tiny race of little people, no bigger than ants, and one of them goes mad with power. Oh, what do you think I've got here now? A whole race of little people. They're scared, Fletch. Petrified. And so they do what they're told. To a god. Because of the discovery, and he starts to think of himself Oh, okay, so I get god. it. What you're thinking about here is ethics. Uh-huh. And I suppose I'm thinking about how Daniel knows that he's doing the right thing, how he's not going to go down the same road as Peter Craig from the Twilight Zone and his God complex. Well, in fact, Daniel reflected on this when I talked with him. So what we are doing is kind of a pretty well boxed in. I mean, we, we are trying to, to design life then, if you will, to be better at producing a therapeutic drug. And we are doing that, as I said, with an isolated cell line uh, that is just growing in the lab. That those cells and uh, will never be released into the environment and, uh, and so on. So I mean, it's it's pretty boxed in. But if you think bigger of it, of course, it has. If you start talking about applications on humans or or, or animals in the wild, it's, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, a whole different thing. But yeah. So what's next? Well, for Daniel, there are two major things, and both comes back to the fact that today. Treatments are being, becoming more and more personalized. So you need to develop more different drugs and they need to then be also cost effective because normally therape biotherapeutics are quite expensive. So how can we develop those drugs quicker and how can we uh, produce them at a lower cost? So then there are two things. One thing is to make show cells that are much more efficient at integrating those DNA molecules that are needed to produce the cells. So that means that we want to develop efficient cells the way you, where the process is, is not random when integrating the DNA molecules. It is targeted so that we know it comes to the same place every time and that same place is highly active for, for producing the proteins. So that's one thing. The other thing is about the yield. And then you would like to kind of change the show cell with modern techniques such as you heard about genome editing and CRISPR-Cas9 and all those, those things. You would like to change the genome of the cell so that it becomes even more efficient at producing proteins. So that's another big area for, for show cells. Those two things together, making it high, much more efficient at developing cells that produce, and those cells should be able to produce at a much higher level. So Daniel is saying that he would have a really large volume of Cho cells, but that he would be able to personalize them and that it's possible to have that personalization on a massive scale. Do you want to produce many different protein drugs, more than it has been used in, done in, in, in the past? In order to do that, that process of developing the, those cells that produce that, those proteins must be much quicker and cheaper. And you would also like it to be cheaper to produce the proteins. And that had several important impacts. I mean, the manufacturing environment will be different. It used to be that you have a blockbuster uh, drug that you want to produce in metric tons, for example. And then you have manufacturing facilities that are built for the sole purpose of developing or producing that particular drug. Uh, huge tanks uh, that are run in the same way every time. Now what will probably happen is that you need to have flexible manufacturing, manufacturing sites where you produce many different drugs throughout the year. Uh, and then comes that in order to make mo the most out of such a factory, 
you will like every single molecule that you want to produce, that you can do that in the short, shortest possible time. And if you have a show cell that produces a lot more of that protein, you can run the process for less in less time and you can switch over to a new product producing that product and so on so that you kind of get an efficient means of supplying the demand of different personalized medicines to the to the market. So even though medicines in production will be changing, Daniel is saying at the end of it all, we'll still have that original Chinese hamster and her ovaries that was handed to Theodore Puck. There, of course, there are uh, attempts to try to see, okay, should we change the, the, the cell to something else? Even there are also thoughts, things, should, do we need a cell at all? Can we take out the most important process, for, process from the cell and make that possible within it? But I definitely think that you, we will use cells for many, many years to come. And show cells is kind of, since it is so heavily entrenched in the, in the area, I think it will be used. And with the technology that is coming today that you can start really changing things, it doesn't really matter what you start with because you can, you can mold it into something different. You could start with a human cell, you can start with something else. The engineering principles will basically be the same and you will, you will create something new. So the show cells of the future will not be really be show cells even though you started out from those show cells. They will be something different, a new life form. Well, that's it for this episode of Discovery Matters. We hope it makes you look differently at hamsters forevermore. Rate us on your podcast app and share the love by sharing this podcast. Thank you for listening. Our executive producer is Andrea Killen. Discovery Matters is produced in collaboration with Soundtelling, production and music by Thomas Henley. Thomas Henley.